Welcome to Witnessing Faith with Bishop Duane. I'm Karen Barry Schwartz, Director of Communications for the Diocese of Venice in Florida. Witnessing Faith with Bishop Duane can be heard here on Relevant Radio on 1410 AM and 106.7 FM in Fort Myers, and 1660 AM and 93.3 FM in Naples, or anytime at dioceseofvenice.org slash ourbishop. Your Excellency Bishop Duane, welcome back to Relevant Radio. Karen, thanks very much. A pleasure to be with you and all our listeners. Bishop, we have a very special event coming up in the Diocese of Venice next month, the Eucharistic Congress and Youth Rally, March 24th and 25th in Fort Myers. You can sign up all the way to the date of the conference, and we'll talk a little bit more about how you can sign up online in a moment. But perhaps we want to begin with a prayer for the Eucharistic Revival, Bishop. Let's do that as we begin, as always, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. My God, we believe, we adore, we hope, and we love you. We beg your pardon for those who do not believe, nor adore, nor hope, nor love you. Most Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we adore you profoundly. We offer you the most precious body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, present in all the tabernacles of the world, in reparation, for the outrage, the sacrileges, and at times the indifference by which he is offended. And through the infinite merits of the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Immaculate Heart of Mary, we beg of you the conversion of sinners. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. Amen. 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 Thank you, Bishop. Today we are going to talk more about the National Eucharistic Revival and specifically the Eucharistic Congress and Youth Rally happening right here in the Diocese of Venice in Fort Myers on March 24th and 25th. Please visit dioceseofvenice.org for more information about the conference and the Youth Rally and to register. And we're blessed today to have two special guests joining us, Teresa Tamio and Father Timothy Anastas, both who will be among our speakers at our diocesan event in March. Welcome, Teresa and Father Anastas, and thank you for joining us on Relevant Radio this morning. Thanks for having us. I want to add my voice to welcoming both of you. We look forward to your kind of teasing out a little bit today what you're going to be talking about, what you're going to be presenting at the time of the Eucharistic Congress. And we very much want to say thank you for accepting our invitations. Teresa Tamia will be a keynote speaker at the Diocese of Venice Eucharistic Congress in Fort Myers on March 25th, and Father Anastos will be a keynote speaker at Eucharistic Congress Youth Rally on March 24th. But before we talk specifically with our guests, I wonder, Bishop, if you might tell our listeners a bit about what is the Eucharistic Congress? What's it all about? Well, the bishops of the United States have called for a kind of a renewal in the teaching in our efforts to teach, I'll put it that way, the presence of Christ within the Eucharist. And in so doing that, there's different phases. And right now we're in the diocesan phase, looking at what can be done, and thus we'll have the conference, and I'll talk about that. And next year we move into a parish phase where things go down, if you want to say, to the very grassroots of life of the church. But the Eucharistic Congress will, if I can say, have two moments. On the 24th of March, It's particularly for the young people of the diocese to instill in them a greater appreciation for the Eucharist and talk about the revival aspect. The March 25th is a different kind of experience where it is for not just the young people, but all the faithful. That is, young people don't have to go home. If they're there and they want to stay, good. Stay and find out some more about Jesus Christ and his presence in the Eucharist. But the revival aims to restore a reverence, if I can say, for and belief in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. That's the aim of what the diocese is trying to do in these days. It's exciting times. And and Bishop, in 2019, we've talked about this. There was a a much talked about Pew Research study that indicated that 69% of all self-identified Catholics said they believe the bread and wine used at Mass are not Jesus, but instead symbols of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And the other 31%, of course, believed in the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist, known as transubstantiation. Can you talk a little bit about that and and how transubstantiation differentiates us as Catholics? I sure can, Karen. And I think we have to say that those numbers did hit us 
right between the eyes when it was announced, and maybe we're stunned for a little while. But the teaching of the church has always been that the Eucharist is the source and the summit of Christian life. And we have to continue to look at that. And what does that mean? In that context, the Eucharist, the transubstantiation, that is, it's a scholastic term, really, to help explain how the bread and the wine become the body and blood of our Lord without losing, if we could say, the exterior appearance. We can talk about the whole substance of the bread, if we want to say, is changed into the body of Christ, and the whole substance of the wine into the blood of Christ. It's truly unique, and it's a wonderful, if we want to say, conversion in a way, because it's, it has everything to do with our belief in our faith, the level of our faith. And that changing of the bread and the wine is really fitting and proper, and it's called transubstantiation and brings about, if you want to say it, results in a new reality, in that what looks to be bread, the wine, is now the body and blood of Christ, precisely because it contains that new reality that is Jesus Christ in his fullest. Father Anastas, I don't know, or Teresa, if you want to add to that at all. I think that's a, a beautiful explanation, and I think it's it's so crucial. It's interesting that, that we're having this interview right now. We, we started a, a series at my parish called The Rescue Project, which is based on a book by a, a good friend of mine, Father John Ricardo, a wonderful priest from the Archdiocese of Detroit. And at our table are two people who are not Catholic. They were raised Catholic, but they became evangelical, and they left the church because they never, quote unquote, met Jesus, or so they thought. And I'm glad that they're taking this course at our Catholic parish. And I think it's so crucial that the bishops are recognizing this and realizing that the experience that these folks have, unfortunately, may have been the experience of others. So I, I just think it's really great that this conference is taking place, this Congress is taking place. And of course, we have next year, the big culmination coming up in, in Indiana next year. I think it's a great effort. And I think more and more people are going to truly finally come to understand the gift we have in the source and summit of our faith in the Eucharist. Yes, and I, I just want to invite anyone who is listening and maybe recording this to really just rewind and listen to what His Excellency just said. Especially for me, when I was in grade school and high school, I was never taught about the Eucharist. It just wasn't taught, and so I didn't know that the Lord was truly present. And so once that happened, when I was in college, it, it literally changed everything about how I lived. Like, if this is true, I have to change everything. And so just to hear a bishop, a, a, an apostle of the church, be able to just teach uh, the, this true presence of the Eucharist, in a very simple but beautiful way that it's so powerful. So yeah, I, I really, really would encourage that. I'd like to tell our listeners a little bit more about our special guests, starting with Teresa. Teresa Tamio is an author, syndicated Catholic talk show host, and motivational speaker with decades of experience in TV, radio, and newspaper. And she now has her own speaking and communications company, Teresa Tamio Communications. Her weekday morning radio program, Catholic Connection, is heard on more than 500 Catholic radio stations worldwide. Teresa, you speak all over the nation, and you often speak of your reversion to the Catholic Church. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Well, I was raised Catholic. Uh, as you and I were chatting before the show, my background, I originally come from the East Coast, and we moved to Michigan when I was a child and went to an excellent Catholic grade school. And I truly do attribute my vocation as a communicator to both the religious sisters and also the lay teachers I had there uh, they found at a very early age that I had the gift of gab and <laughs> and encouraged me to go to go into communications. But what happened was at the same time, I did have a very powerful experience, and I'm going to talk about this at the Congress, very powerful experience when I made my Holy Communion. I couldn't basically explain it from a theological perspective, but in my heart, I knew that that was Jesus. And nobody had to tell me that that, that really give me an explanation. I just somehow got it. And at the same time, the teachers were recognizing my gift for Gab, and they were getting me very involved in different speaking events at the grade school level in terms of doing little you know, Christmas productions and, and Easter plays and whatnot. And I had another teacher who told me that I was a good writer and I should consider going into broadcast journalism. And so there was two things going on. I was discovering my faith, but the world, even back in the early 70s, the pull was so strong, especially for women back then, because the broadcasting industry was really opening up for women. And so for me, I received a lot of accolades for my ability to communicate, even at a young age, and unfortunately left God behind. It wasn't 
as if, oh, I don't like the Catholic Church, I don't like this teaching, but the pull of the world was so strong. By the time I got to high school, it was all about what college, where am I going? I had my, yeah, I was still a very type A personality. I had my college picked out by the time I was 15. Uh, I was off to the races and I never looked back. And unfortunately, for a long time, I left God in the rearview mirror. I had a lot of success. I'm really shortening the story. I'll give more details when I when I talk at the event. But a lot of success in the secular media, won all kinds of awards, was an anchor woman reporter. But I also realized it was very empty. And same thing happened to my husband where he was raised Catholic and we were kind of going through this same, um, you know, lapsed Catholic experience at the same time. And he came back to the church through a non-denominational Bible study, rediscovered the faith, entered the diaconate. I went into the same Bible study, left journalism, became an on-fire, you know, born-again Catholic, and thought I was going to evangelize everybody in the newsroom where I was working at the time, uh, but soon decided that I didn't have a place anymore in the secular media. And in 2000, I just offered myself up to God again and said, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I've got these gifts and, you know, use me. And then sooner, within a few months of that, I received a call from my friend Al Cresta at Ave Maria Radio. And the rest is history. I started doing the show 20 years ago in December, and then it was syndicated and picked up by EW Chan. And the Lord has opened all kinds of doors for me to speak and share my testimony. My husband and I share our testimony as a deacon couple and how the Lord saved our marriage. But I, I consider the Eucharist to be at the heart of that because even when I was going through this, this reversion, and we had many wonderful evangelical friends who invited them to their churches. You know, I never officially, my husband and I never officially left the church. We just fell away. But for me, it's like, well, okay, they're very nice churches. They have a nice sermon. They have beautiful music. But Jesus isn't there in the Eucharist. And I recognize that. And that's why I knew I could never leave, officially leave the Catholic Church and join. And, and that's why I'm, um, I'm Catholic today, the Eucharist, body, blood, soul, and divinity. It sounds like you had a very early experience with your first communion with yeah. Jesus, which is which is beautiful. Teresa, you know, when I was in school, I had nuns as teachers, also in a small grade school. I think I had the gift of gab, but I do have to say, those teachers I had, those sisters, they didn't appreciate it at all. <laughs> so obviously, I didn't exhibit the talent you did, because it usually got me into the corner some way. <laughs> But, Teresa, I have another question for you. At the Eucharistic Congress here in the Diocese of Venice, I think you're giving one presentation to the full assembly, and it's titled Rediscovering the Eucharist on My Journey. And then another is to one of the women's breakout groups, and it's called Becoming a True Daughter of the King by Way of the Eucharist. I know you don't want to give everything away, but I'm wondering if you could just tease a few points out of those. What is it you're going to be talking about? Well, I think in, in the main talk, I'll be giving a little bit more details of, of my journey and my husband's journey, uh, our journey you know, back into the Catholic faith, our journey of our healing of marriage and, and our journey through the diaconate, where we're at now in our, in our lives in terms of how the Lord is using us. Uh, and there'll be some funny stories about growing up in an Italian-American family and, and, and my mom. I've got a new book coming out about my mom, so I'll be picking up on some of the things that she taught me about the Catholic faith. I think in the, in the women's session, which is really, 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 I think, very important, What's happening in the world today where we've totally lost the identity of male and female, if you think about it, I mean, we are created in, in God's image, male and female. And I really want to stress with women that when you give yourself over to the Lord, and especially, for example, understanding who Jesus is in the Eucharist, that that's him, and that you give everything, you don't hold anything back. And that means that even if you don't understand everything, to trust God enough, if you trust God enough with your life and making a commitment to him, then you have to trust him with all of your life. And that means even if you don't agree with, for example, the male priesthood, even if you don't agree with other teachings that the church may have, you know what? You say, Jesus, I trust in you. And then you say, God, show me. And that's what I went through. I walked through and I taught myself the faith because when we came back to the church so many years ago, we didn't have relevant radio or EW10. I mean, it was a long time ago. We didn't have all these great resources with all the apologetic material. But I really think it is about, do you, you know, who do you say that I am? Do you believe him? Because Jesus is never, ever going to limit you. And when you give yourself to him, he's going to use those gifts. And women have been so misled. And I was like that because I, you know, I thought I knew everything and I, I knew <laughs> practically nothing. One of my books that I've written is called Extreme Makeover, Women Transformed by Christ, Not Conformed to the Culture. And I walk women through, why does the church teach this? Why does the church teach that? And no, this is not true. So the, the whole thing that I try to say is you have to trust the Lord enough because he, he wants to give us so much. And there is no better place, I always say, for a woman to be in relationship with Christ, but in 
the Catholic Church because she is going to be protected. She is going to be uplifted and she is going to be able to be blessed and also to grow in those gifts that God has given her specifically as a woman made in his image and likeness. We are equal, but we're different. And that's a big, big point that I'm going to make in that talk. You are listening to Witnessing Faith with Bishop Duane on Relevant Radio. I'm Karen Barry Schwartz, Director of Communications for the Diocese of Venice in Florida. Witnessing Faith with Bishop Duane can be heard anytime at relevantradio.com and on the last Friday of each month on 1410 AM and 106.7 FM in Fort Myers and 1660 AM and 93.3 FM in Naples or anytime at dioceseofvenice.org slash ourbishop. We are speaking today with Teresa Tomio and Father Timothy Anastas, two of the nationally known speakers who will be at the Diocese of Venice Eucharistic Congress and Youth Rally on March 24th and 25th in Fort Myers. Visit dioceseofvenice.org for a complete list of speakers and activities and to register. Uh, Father Anastas, I'd like to talk to you a little bit. I'd like to tell our listeners a little bit about you first. Father Timothy Anastas is one of 50 National Eucharistic Preachers, a diverse group of priests who have been commissioned to enkindle the flame of Eucharistic faith and devotion in the United States through Eucharistic preaching. Father Anastos is Associate Chaplain at the St. John Paul II Newman Center at the University of Illinois in Chicago. And Father Tim is also the host of the popular video series, Real Homilies, R-E-E-L, presented by Spirit Juice. Father Could you tell us a little bit about what it means to be one of the nation's 50 Eucharistic preachers? Yeah, absolutely. One thing, it's just an honor to be uh, counted among 50 priests who are going around the country preaching on the true presence of the Eucharist, how much the Lord desires an intimate relationship with us through himself in the Eucharist. And yeah, it's this powerful experience of recognizing that all of the bishops of the United States desire for this to be on the forefront of our minds as American Catholics. It it brings me a lot of inspiration to know that all the bishops of the United States are taking this very seriously. And it should be an inspiration to us all that this is really important. And so uh, I've been going around to different dioceses, different places around the United States, getting to just preach about the Eucharist. And one powerful moment for me was when all of us, all 50 of us, got together here in Chicago for a retreat. Bishop Cousins led it. He sent every. he basically, it was kind of like a Pentecost. He prayed over us and he sent us out to go and preach about Jesus Christ, truly present. It was a very powerful moment knowing that I have my bishops supporting me in this. So this is a very fortified, Holy Spirit driven thing that we're doing. And it's very inspiring. That's very exciting. We've heard a lot of fascinating facts about you, Father. I understand you've received the Eucharist in 27 countries, and I love that you've described being a priest as awesome sauce. And you also, I understand, turned down a very interesting job as an FBI agent, I believe, to become a priest. So I'd love to hear about any or all of that. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, thank you. Yeah. When it came to my college career, I was studying linguistics, and I was concentrating in the language of Arabic. And so I think the FBI wanted to snag me up to, you know, save the world or something in that way. Around the end of my time in college at the University of Illinois, as I was really being drawn towards the priesthood and drawn drawn towards an intimate relationship with the Lord, I got offered this job with the FBI. I had a great girlfriend, but there was something within my heart that was saying, like, there's something still empty and there's something still restless. And I won't, I won't rest until I actually say yes to the Lord. But it was always rooted in the Eucharist that my vocation came from the Eucharist. There was a moment in my senior year where we were having what was called Mass on the Grass, which was an evangelization opportunity. We would have Mass on the Quad at the University of Illinois. I was serving the Mass, helping the Monsignor who was celebrating the Mass out. At the end of the Mass, we had leftover Jesus, that leftover Eucharist that we had to bring back to the Newman Center. And so we walked to his car. He's holding the ciborium filled with our Lord. And he looked at me and handed me the ciborium and said something very simple, but it struck my heart and <laughs> continued to strike. It's continuing to strike my heart. He, even in this moment, he said, will you hold our Lord for me? And he just asked that simple 
simple question, will you hold our Lord for me? And so we got in the car, I'm holding the Lord, and that phrase is going in and out of my heart. Will you hold, hold me as a priest? And so this just desire to hold him in the Eucharist, to have other people receive him, the true presence was the source of my vocation. Uh, thank you for sharing that. That's a very profound experience. I'm also aware that you have, you do something that's quite unique. You have a one-minute homily program geared to young people, where you present the Sunday Gospel reading through the lens of not only church tradition, but also pop culture. So I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about that and why you think that resonates with the youth and that that is so important today. Absolutely. Thank you, Bishop. Yeah, the, I mean, first and foremost, young people's attention spans are zero. <laughs> So to be able to uh, be able to give a good catechesis in a very short amount of time is very key with young people. And I found that very helpful with college kids. But even more so, I don't know if you're aware of in social media, they have what is called the algorithm. The algorithm basically figures out what you love and what you desire and shows you more and more of that social media. As you go through the reels, more and more of what you like or desire, whether it's good or bad, shows up. And so I had a very profound experience a couple of years ago where um, someone who was very, very close to me, I saw his social media and what the algorithm was showing him. And it really it hurt a lot to see the things that he was looking at because the algorithm, whether good or bad, it shows you what you want to see. And so this desire in my heart, especially with college kids going through so many reels and, and social media, I want to be able to have them change the algorithm. Because if they're looking at good and true and beautiful things, then the algorithm will show them more good and true and beautiful things. And that's how, in my own way as a college chaplain, trying to fight back against the algorithm and allow the college kids to have an opportunity to see things that are good and true and beautiful and from the Lord. Karen, I wonder if you let me ask one more question. It's for both Father and Teresa. The bishops in the United States really are calling for a focus on the Holy Eucharist. What challenge do you see facing young people today in the practice of the faith? And how can we as church really draw them in to a living relationship with the Lord in the sacrament, in the Eucharist? I don't know who wants to go first, either one. Yeah, I think something for me that I've just noticed with my own college kids is a lack of understanding that with the Lord, you can live an abundant life. So often college kids walking around, uh, if you have any kids or grandkids, you may notice their hood is up, their head is down, looking at their phones. It's almost like they're living this half life, almost like the life of a zombie. And so to be able to push them towards the Eucharist is unleashing and unlocking this, this abundant life within them that when they are in front of the Lord, it's like being in front of a nuclear reactor, that they can just receive that absolute love, that they can remind themselves that they, their identity is that they're a son or a daughter of the Lord. So I think that's, that's the first step to recognize that when you're close to the Eucharist, you're unlocking this abundant life within you. I, I just want to echo and pick up on that. Those are great points, Father, and I would, I would definitely second that. And I love that verse in John 10, 10, I've come to give you life but abundantly. And I think, unfortunately, perhaps because of some of the issues that we struggle with in the church in terms of uh, the abuse crisis over the years, whatever it may be, or the church being portrayed very poorly and very inaccurately by the culture and the secular media. And I'll be talking a little bit about this with my expertise in media and my event. But there is this idea out there that if you let go and let God, that you're going to be living this life of misery with nothing but you know, sackcloth and ashes. And in my life, I can tell you that I have never been happier. I never expected to be this fulfilled. I mean, when, when the Lord saved our marriage and he gave me a new direction in my career, I was like, this is amazing. This is incredible. I could have never envisioned what God has done for me in terms of the ability and the gift to be able to reach people every day for him and to speak and to write and to our, a passion of, of mine and my husband's is to really share the faith through pilgrimage and through our favorite place, because we're both of Italian American heritage, to take people to Italy several times a year and show them the beauty and bring them to the tombs of the saints. Never in my wildest dreams would I have even imagined that I could do this. I, I, it's just so much more. And God is, God is a God of abundance and joy and love. And I know that we recently had in mass the, the verse about um, 
what eye has not seen or ear has not heard. And many people interpret that, and I'm not a scripture scholar, but correctly that the Lord could be referring to, to life with him in heaven. But I actually think he's talking about life here, that he wants to give us the abundant life. Yes, we are in a fallen world and we're all going to suffer. But at the same time, when you are in a relationship with God, you know and are helped in dealing with that suffering and you can you can learn from it, you know, Romans 8, 28. But I think encouraging people, as Father said, that Jesus wants the best for us and he wants an abundant life. And to talk about the joy and to be joyful. And also, I think there's so much sadness out there. I don't know if you caught the new CDC study that just came out from the Centers for Disease Control. It's absolutely shocking, especially for young girls in terms of the depression, the right. loneliness, the attempted suicides, the suicide plans, the increased suicides. And this is post-COVID. It's not pre-COVID. This is post-COVID. And so they're still struggling and trying to make meaning out of life. And when the world is pushing God out everywhere, it makes it almost virtually impossible for them to understand exactly what Father said. So I think the joy, bringing the joy of the Lord and having them know that the only true happiness, which I will attest to in great detail at the Congress, is going to be coming first and foremost from that relationship with God, starting with the Eucharist. I love that you've both spoken about uh, living a life with the Lord is a life of joy and abundance. A phrase, Father, that you used in one of your one-minute homilies was if you give the Lord a minute, he'll give you eternity. I, I love that. And I'm sure that resonates with a lot, of, a lot of young people. I'd like to talk a little bit before we close about the Eucharistic Congress so our listeners can hear kind of specifically what we will have there, Bishop. Okay, both on the Friday evening event for the younger people and then for the event all day Saturday, I think we're offering a large number of speakers, national speakers, two who are with us today. And I think the presentations will be unique. Also, there, there's men's and women's groups, and there's groups for the young men and young women, breakout sessions. We're going to break into English and Spanish tracks because we have, that represents who we are. And young people from both language groups will be present. Something called the Vigil Project is the popular music group that's going to be playing I can't admit to be really up to date on the reputation of the group, but I'm told they're very popular. What I do know about is we have opportunities also for confession, for adoration. We'll have Eucharistic procession. We'll have the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. And there'll, I think, be a great deal of fraternity, community, inspiration, and living according to how Christ has called us to come together as one. So I think that kind of highlights many of the opportunities people will have to come together as believers. Well, we're certainly looking forward to having all of our speakers, especially you, Father Anastas, and you, Teresa. And Mass will be celebrated by Bishop Duane at the Youth Rally and at the Eucharistic Congress. So, Bishop Duane, we're all excited that you will be there as well, certainly. We have been talking today with Most Reverend Frank J. Duane, Bishop of the Diocese of Venice and two nationally known and beloved Catholic speakers, Teresa Tomeo and Father Timothy Anastas. Thank you, Teresa and Father Anastas, for joining us this morning. And as always, thank you, Your Excellency, Bishop DeWayne. Bishop, perhaps we would like to close with a prayer? Okay, let's do that. Once again, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord, thank you for the gift of your real presence in the Eucharist. Grant us the grace to prioritize time with you in your loving presence, and to bring others to experience your powerful, real presence also. We do ask this all through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Bishop. You have been listening to Witnessing Faith with Bishop Duane. I'm Karen Barry Schwartz, Director of Communications for the Diocese of Venice in Florida. We have been speaking today with Teresa Tamio and Father Timothy Anastas, two of the nationally known speakers who will be at the Diocese of Venice Eucharistic Congress and Youth Rally on March 24th and 25th in Fort Myers. Visit dioceseofvenice.org for more information about the Diocese of Venice Eucharistic Congress and Youth Rally happening on Friday, March 24th and Saturday, March 25th. There you will find a complete list of speakers and activities and a link to register. And we hope to see you there. Witnessing Faith with Bishop Duane can be heard here on Relevant Radio on 1410 AM and 106.7 FM in Fort Myers, and 1660 AM and 93.3 FM in Naples, or anytime at dioceseofvenice.org slash ourbishop.